Uh, thank you and good afternoon and welcome. I'm actually really honored to be out here and uh, getting to present after two years of not presenting. So welcome to everyone here in person and everyone joining us online. Uh, it's actually a real honor and it's actually a privilege since it's my first time at KubeCon and SecurityCon. And I'm just curious with a show of hands, how many of you folks are new to the conference? All right, well, it's great to meet everyone and hopefully I get a chance to talk to you guys, uh, you folks uh, today, tomorrow, and this week. All right, so. Session today is on the five reasons to invest in the, in the software supply chain and securing the software supply chain and recover some, some myths as well as to um, you know, things uh, that come up in the context of the supply chain that we want to make sure that we, uh, we address and get into the right context as we, um, as we look at investing in this area. So just a little bit about me. I um, got my start in Wall Street IT. I moved uh, to the West Coast, joined Microsoft, primarily worked in systems management, virtualization management. I got to work with some standards organizations around storage management, primarily DMTF and SNEA, and uh, I got a chance to ship some cloud on-prem products uh, as well. And more recently, I joined the Strategic Missions and Technologies Group in Microsoft, where we focus on uh, su supply chain and supply chain security. And so um, at home, I currently find myself um, keeping my senior dogs from getting annoyed by the new puppy that's been introduced. So that's always fun. All right. So with the talk, all the talk this week are on SBOM, supply chain at the conference, and just in general with what we hear in the news and just the ongoing and relentless, relentless attacks uh, that are you know, pretty much hitting every industry. Um, it's good to put it in context as to exactly what is to gain, I guess, if, from the cyber, uh, from the cyber crimes that are out there. Uh, in terms of cyber damage cost, you know, we're looking at $6 trillion in 2021, uh, potentially exceeding $10.5 trillion by 2025. And uh, as well, we see the investments in cyber, cybersecurity also increasing uh, actually substantially from $3.5 billion in 2014 and then cumulatively going to about a trillion dollars between 2017 and 2025. Now, I put these side to side just to c uh, compare the growth in both the investments and the damage, uh, not so much as a statement on how much should be invested to match the actual damage that are out there. Uh, but we do know that more is needed and uh, faster. So let's put the supply chain in context. Um, we hear, I mean, so the supply chain in context to me covers three areas, software development, software deployment, and software runtime. So if we start with the software development side, uh, to me, the supply chain and everything that goes into it has to account for not only where the code is actually being developed, when it's, where it's being checked in, who's checking it in, you know, are these uh, verifiable sources, are these repos healthy? You know, there's a big, uh, big part of, sorry, one, yeah. So there, there's, a lot, there's a lot that goes just to making sure that the code is authentic and the integrity of the code itself. Um, and that spans the software and the underlying hardware of that, of that development environment. And then when we, yep, when, we, when we move forward to the deployment phase, now we have to make sure that we know what we're getting is healthy. We know that we can verify the sources, both of the repositories and the issuers of, the, of whatever claims. You know, that's where we look at the SBOMs that are being generated. We want to make sure that those SBOMs are generated at check-in time and not after, uh, after the build is complete, you know, and we want to know that we're actually using hardened deployment processes, especially when you're deploying at the edge or, you know, um, in a sovereign environment, you may not actually have direct access, direct control over the infrastructure that's being deployed. So you want to make sure that your, your processes are hardened both in the software side and also in the infrastructure deployment. And then once you're running this environment and running the software, you know, you're going to have drift, right? Um, and unless you're investing heavily in the automation and all the tooling that can guarantee that drift doesn't happen, you know, you want, to, you, you, you want that monitoring, you want, you want that observability. You know, do you have those hardened package management tools that will get you the, the right updates, the secure updates? 
you know, um, if, you're, if, you've got, if you've got your your infrastructure team, your operations team, actually doing break fix on those environments, on that infrastructure, are they producing signed scripts, right? That's something that we learned as part of deploying uh, uh, cloud on-prem, is how do you seal the box and everything that our SREs have to do on those systems can actually be from a trusted source, in this case being Microsoft, but that the customer gets the guarantee as well that whatever's being put on their systems to initiate a break fix is actually uh, verified. All right, so this, the supply chain primarily, you know, we talk a lot about the software development side, but it does span um, all the way into the runtime, all, you know, through the updates and eventually into decommissioning, right? We put a lot of work, especially in the hyperscale cloud uh, service providers, on the secure destruction of data to ensure that nothing actually leaks out of, out of, the, um, uh, out of the data center. Okay, so let's get to the first myth. Uh, once you create your SBOM, you're pretty much done, right? Well, let's, uh, first question is what are you describing, right? We talk a lot about describing the dependencies, the binaries, the uh, Docker image, with images, whatever you wanna, or the container images. You can start there, but that quickly starts, if you start peeling that onion or pulling that thread, you know, you're gonna start asking more questions, right? You know, is it the, beyond the entire package? At what granularity? What are your upstream dependencies? You know, what are you expecting to see in that metadata? You know, uh, do you have any kind of um, vulnerability information captured inside? You know, do you have your CVE scan results also in there? And there's a bunch of tools that come along with that, right? Not only with SBOM and the formats, whether it's Cyclone DX, SPDX, um, Ava Black covered uh, Gitbomb earlier today, you know, but then you get into uh, the signing of those statements and what it actually means to be a verifiable statement, um, and then the automation, right? The frameworks like Intoto and Tuff, Tuff giving you those uh, sealed updates, and eventually the observability side, right? How do you get to the, you know, multiple levels of, of, of a secure environment and the promises that you've gone through each of those steps and, you know, met those requirements and that's where something like salsa comes in. So, I like to use. Uh, I like to, you know, start with the fact that SPOMs are typically used as an ingredients list or the comparison that it's the ingredients list to something that you buy in a store or maybe you get something on the menu. But I want to pull that thread a little bit more, and I want to use an, um, an example that is uh, from a show co called Portlandia, you know, um, and in basically two minutes of a couple entering a store, they ask about the chicken that's on the menu. And they, you know, they learn a lot of great things, like you know, the chicken's name is Colin, uh, you know, its breed, and you know, what it was fed. Uh, but then they start asking, you know, they start pulling the thread more. You know, um, is it happy? Did it have friends? You know, uh, is, it, is the information that's being provided actually you know, real? Um, is it organic, right? Does it meet whatever requirements of organic? What kind of organic? You know, and eventually, you know, where did it grow up? You know, who, own, who owns that farm? You know, and the person that's actually providing this information, that service provider in that case, it's not an authoritative source. They, you, and, you know, whatever they're saying, you know, could be true. You can't verify. You don't know if it's authentic. They're just trying to do their, the best that they can to the best of their abilities. So in the same way, if you looked at uh, lettuce, Right, you've got DNA markers embedded into the lettuce itself that if you need to trace back a parasite outbreak or any kind of bacterial outbreak, you know what farm that lettuce came from. So I like those kind of examples because um, it gets, sorry, it gets us you know, thinking more about what else could we include as part of that SBOM and what other artifacts we want to include. Right? When we say artifacts, uh, sorry, when I say artifacts in this discussion, I'm going beyond just the SPOM, the document, but any kind of, for example, measurements that are being done on the, on the code itself, um, you know, any kind of logs that need to be uh, added, or even a manual attestation, right, of maybe some SDL process that isn't automated, that you, but you want to make sure that it's captured and signed by someone within the organization, right? So, um, all right, so then we get to the second half of that myth, which is, you know, once you create the SBOM and you've got your software captured, you know, you're pretty much done. And in fact, what we're seeing and, you know, some of the investments that we're making, actually we want to extend the build of materials concept and that artifact gathering and verification concept 
uh, beyond the software into the underlying hardware. So you can see, for example, uh, the, the chip manufacturing industry, highly automated, huge investments in, these, in, these, uh, in, in fabrication, you know, and you know, they've, got, they've got all of this nailed down, but they're really siloed because of that IP that they carry within those, within those fabs. And so, you know, you really can't make any determination on the, on, the, um, on, on the chips itself. You know, you just have to trust that it's being done right. And what we've seen recently with NVIDIA is that anyone is susceptible to, to these kind of threats. Um, if you look at system integration, right, once those chips leave the fabs, they get sent to these uh, ODMs, you know, and eventually they get put into systems by a system integrator, you know, that's another level of bill of materials, right? If you're in procurement, you know that anytime you order a server, you're giving that bill of materials to you know, your, your hardware vendor, and you want to make sure that what you get back is actually that server, and that it's something that uh, ideally isn't you know, tampered with, especially if you're going to a secure environment or in, uh, in the federal space. Um, so two sides to that myth about you know, just being at one SPOM and you're done both on when you're pulling the onion on the fractal of dependencies, as uh, Ava put it earlier today, and also how deep into the stack do you actually go beyond just describing the software. So uh, the next question is, you know, you've got the SBOM and that's it. It, just, it can be trusted, right? This is a really simple one. Um, SBOMs can be modified, all right? And uh, it's, you know, the metadata that's contained there, there's really no way of proving uh, you know who generated it, and if it's something, if it's an authentic uh, piece of documentation, and if even if it's verifiable. So this is where we get into, you know, if you pull on the Colin example, right? A farmer could say, all right, um, Colin, right, grew up on Contoso Farms, and I'm signing that statement. That's a statement that I'm making about this particular product. So you get into, you know, to you know the salsa example, where in this case we're talking about attestations, right? Where you take that. The artifact itself is the document or the log or something else, but now you're making a statement. You're making a statement about that particular artifact, and then you want to make sure that it's signed, and you want to make sure that it's something that's verifiable, right? And so you get both the, you know, uh, you put it in an envelope, and then you've got those bundles of attestations that actually describe your microservice, your service, your product, you know, whatever, whatever you're trying to describe uh, in your environment. Okay. So this gets us to you know, uh, if it, can it be trusted, and also the integrity. So uh, Skit is actually a framework and an architecture uh, that has been worked on in, 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 the, uh, in the open community where we're looking at how to enhance the security of the ledgers themselves. So ledgers that you've heard on today, you're we're talking about, you know, uh, append-only uh, append ledgers that are tamper-proof, built on Merkle trees, all goodness. Um, what we've done with Skit is actually take that a step further, and we give you three guarantees, uh, both in, uh, when it comes to encryption. Encryption on disk, encryption in transit, and encryption in use. And this is where we get to the, the conversation about on secure enclaves. So uh, on the Skit side and the Skit service, uh, there's essentially three guarantees that the service itself is making. The first one is that the statements are issued um, you know, by someone that's identifiable, that's authentic, and no takesy backsies, right? You can't say, yeah, I didn't say that. So you're non-reputable, right? And then the next step is to say that those statements get registered on a secure ledger that's immutable, right? And that's secure from, from top to bottom, okay? Um, and the next one is that the issuers, sorry. That's right. So the issuers can prove to any other party that those claims actually exist in that ledger with a receipt. Once you have that receipt and you actually have that, uh, you know, the combination of receipt and the claim, you know that it was recorded in the ledger and that you can actually trust what's actually being uh, put out there. Uh, now, this architecture is actually built on um, confidential computing. So in Azure, the confidential computing VMs uh, running Intel SGX. Uh, offer that secure enclave. And that's, what, that's a technology that gives you that uh, guarantees at the chip level that uh, the memory space, the data, is actually protected while in use. So there's no chance of tampering while the data is being written to the ledger itself. Okay, so let's uh, quickly walk through 
the architecture and just a, you know, a simple workflow. Uh, first, we start with who, right? So we start with the, with the DID, uh, the decentralized identity. Once we have that identity um, captured, the next step, we actually can then generate our artifacts, SBOMs, logs, whatever it is. And so once I have that, that artifact, next thing I want to do is generate a statement. Right, this is what I'm saying about this artifact, which is what, what I eventually want to wrap into, a, into the next step, which is, um, sorry, so, which I'm eventually going to wrap into a claim. Now, I get my endorsement from the DID based on, my, uh, my, on the identity, and I, I can use that to gener generate a claim. Now, the claim itself is what, you know, wrapped in a cozy envelope, which includes protected headers, the payload itself, which is the statement, and the signature that comes from your, um, your DID. So now with that claim in hand, uh, what I can do is now record it in a ledger. So the SCIT, uh, SCIT architecture provides, or the SCIT service provides a transparency service. That transparency service is the one that records it in the ledger. Once it's recorded in a ledger, what you actually get back is a countersign statement that, uh, sorry, a counter signature that we call a receipt. Okay, so once with the original claim in hand and a receipt, now you have a transparent claim. And the, 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 uh, the beauty about this uh, part of the system is that now you can use that transparent claim to actually verify all the information that was put into the ledger itself because you have a receipt of the, that the data was actually written to into the service. Uh, the, the transparent service itself will guarantee that a receipt is not given until the data is written. Right? So if you have a receipt, data has been written, and now you can, uh, whether it's yourself as part of verifying in, in, you know, in, uh, in real time, or let's say an auditor needs to go in and you know, basically run through all the verification um, for an investigation or something else, they can use those transparent claims, which is a claim in the receipt, uh, against the ledger to walk through all the uh, um, everything that they need to verify. All right. Give me one second. Okay. So the next one is, okay, so you've generated the SBOM. And we saw a lot of this as well as we were going through the, the executive order and making sure that we, you know, we, we met uh, all the requirements there. You know, a lot of the folks that are actually doing this work, uh, they don't know all the details that go behind what's, you know, uh, what's actually going into the guarantees that you, you want to make, whether it's, you know, uh, the SDL guarantees or the SBOM and everything else. So, just saying that, yeah, I, I did X, checkbox, done. Uh, we know that that's not enough. Being compliant uh, you know, is not a way of, gain, of getting to, to be secure. Um, simple example is what happened at Target in 2013. PCI DSS compliant, yet they still got hacked uh, a few weeks later. And uh, even though they earned that certificate that said that they were compliant. So this is where we get into you know, um, thing, uh, uh, a way of looking at the executive order that actually uh, has multiple parts that actually can contribute to it. First, you're looking at the uh, Secure Software Development Framework, the SSDF, right? And then from there, the uh, Supply Chain Risk Management document and also Zero Trust Architecture. And gives you a way of mapping from the EO and through what the requirements are, or, you know, the recommendations are, into actual practices and tasks that can be done to meet those requirements. And the beauty about this system is that it, it's really not meant to be fire and forget or one and done, right? You do it and you want, you want it to be continuous. You want to keep building those practices so that you know, this becomes inherent in what you do on day to day. You shift left in terms of, uh, of, of your test environment and you start these uh, security practices from the beginning. And um, lastly, with willpower alone, you can push through those tough days. I'm going to get a little bit more personal here, but you know, uh, between long hours, you know, keeping up with the, with the increased threats uh, coming into your environment, you know, there's a, a widening skill gap that's been seen as well uh, in terms of cancellations being uh, cancellation of events, you know, the the, onset, the pandemic, you know, and then just the relentless security reviews and audits and everything else. Uh, we know that there's eventually going to be burnout, right? So uh, part of that you know, is asking for help. And that's, you know, something that does require a certain level of vulnerability, but it's something that, you know, once you have that network of support around you, you know, it's something that can help you through those tough days. 
you know, setting healthy boundaries at work as well. Uh, sometimes it's, it's not easy. You know, current uh, recent survey that was done uh, measuring that about 47% of security uh, admins and operations folks, you know, working over 40 hours a week up into the 90 hour range. So, um, and with the cyber damages and the incentive that these guys have, that these folks have to actually do this, you know, to actually do uh, damage into an environment, you know, that threat is just going to continue to increase. You know, and also just understanding you know, what you need to do to recover, whether even a microdose of recovery, and obviously sleep as well. So with that, I've got a few resources that I've added into the deck itself, and uh, that you can check, off, uh, check up offline, and that is it. So I thank you for your time, thank you for your attention, and open to any questions as well if, if you have them. Okay, thank you. Questions? So uh, I have one question. So how does this align with the six door, right? So the framework that you mentioned, the architecture. Uh, so uh, do you see any synergies there? Uh, as of right now, it's they're separate, okay. but it's something that we need to also look at and investigate because uh, there, there are some similarities there when it comes to having a ledger and ensuring that you've got you know your your trusted your root of trust uh, but as of right now those are those two are separate oh, okay. yeah okay yeah any other question yeah thanks thanks Hector. great yeah. thank you very much everyone appreciate it